A monarch, sundered in mind, wallows in the ruination of his kingdom. A demon spurned engages in macabre play among the charred remains of a burnt city. A prisoner, tortured and abandoned, languishes within the haunted crypts of Skyrest Bridge. These three individuals, happen upon in various states of decay and in distant locations are nonetheless connected, their tragic tales bound to one another through ties stronger than steel. Disparate appearances obfuscate the realization that these sad souls are of one family, wrapped in royal purple, that has fallen to the same ungodly corruption, eating their kingdom. This is Mornstead's monarchy, withered and deplorable, and in this video we'll weave the tale that unites King Bramus, his prized queen, and his afflicted child into one tapestry. We'll learn of their cherished love, and of their tragic desecration acted upon by a vengeful god from an infernal realm. Let's dive in. Skyrest Bridge, a sanctuary for souls wearied by these dark days, and a shrine of reverence dedicated to heroic leaders of ages past, invokes feelings of repose. But the still tranquility that permeates this somber chamber is pierced by tortured wails of one left to rot among the tombs. As the lamp bearer unlocks Skyrest's secrets and endeavors the tunnels hidden within its bowels, they happen upon a wretch imprisoned in squalor. Bloodied and beaten, this helpless soul's fate lies entirely in the lamp bearer's hands. The tortured prisoner is gripped by madness, frail and despondent. Who is she? What terrible crime has she committed to meet such justice, and what of her captors? Engaged in conversation, she offers little truth and no reason to these questions. She seems entirely common, one of thousands across the torn kingdom that has fallen victim to calamity. But her looks deceive. Behind iron bars, gagged and bound, sits none other than Sophisha, wife of Bramus the Seventeenth, an illustrious queen of Mornstead. Insanity has stripped her of composure, poise, and purpose. How Sophisha met such a fate and how her kingdom came to ruin have their inception years prior, in times and lands distant from this grim reality. The royal tale begins in the sheltered trappings of Mornstead's nobility, where a young girl of middling wealth but outstanding beauty yearns for purpose beyond the confines of her familial manor. Sophisha is born to a respected but hardly influential family. Her destiny is to cultivate manners befitting a noble, to engage in leisure and pursue knowledge as to make her desirable for a suitor. Days spent in wondrous daydreams evening spent with polite society, a simple and cultured life. Little information can be gleaned of Sophisha's early years, but born into a noble family of lower status, Sophisha never expected or desired to rise to a position of any real power. Here she remains an idol. Meanwhile, across the lands, a young king is groomed in the ways of princes and courts. Bramus, seventeenth of his name, is inheritor to the titles and throne of Mornstead. The king is of an indomitable spirit, possessed of vitality and grace. He quickly earns renown both on the field of battle and within the royal court, as he tirelessly works to stabilize a kingdom that by the time of his accession is troubled with strife. His constant travels take Bramus to every corner of the known realms. Here, fate intervenes and guides the king's path through the beautiful Sophisha's country. A chance encounter with King Bramus the Seventeenth not only alters the course of her life, but that of her entire homeland. The young Bramus is struck presently by her aura, and though Sophisha is but a lesser noble from relative obscurity, she swiftly captures the king's heart. He's astonished by her uncompromising beauty, her sharp wit, and her penetrating mind. He sees in Sophisha one in whom he can confide, one who will help elevate his kingdom, and most importantly, one whom he loves. Sophisha sees in Bram as a heartfelt and kind soul, whose standing will elevate her to the center of politics, where plays for power and glory are made by duplicitous courtiers, wholly different from the life she at first envisioned. 
Her affection for Bramus, however, is profoundly sincere. The pair engage one another, but upon returning to Mornstead, shock echoes throughout the citizenry. The king is the most illustrious position, and the station of queen should be offered through agreement with neighboring countries as a political tool to secure borders, establish military alliances, and trade agreements. It's hardly a seat that can be borne by whim and fancy. His people see Bramus's marriage to someone as common as Sophisha as the ultimate selfish behavior. They cannot comprehend how she improves the kingdom, how she supports and shares in Bramus's hardships. Shed their words or veil when they speak to me of it, but I know what they think. That by marrying such a minor noble, I'm putting my own happiness before the good of the royal line and the welfare of Mondstadt. But they don't see in her all of the things that I do. This kingdom is my home. I will do everything I can to protect it, as I always have. As you did, Mother. But I refuse to accept that that requires forsaking the woman I love. Sophia only makes me a better man, a better king. And Mornstead will be all the stronger with her at my side. Despite court grumblings, wedding chimes soon ring out across the land as Mornstead celebrates a royal marriage. For several years, the royal couple rule side by side, endure hardship, engage in administration, and navigate politics, the consequence of which strengthens Bramus and Sophia's love for one another, unites them in body and soul. It's a time of prosperity, but the golden age of King Bramus' rule is to be shortly surrounded by darkness and pain. None know it yet, but the beacons of the sentinels that have for millennia imprisoned the demon god Adir weaken, and the holy order of the hallowed sentinels, indeed all of Mornstead, soon slip into derangement. A time of disquiet descends. Strange pestilence sweeps through the countryside, and a bizarre plague, the source of which is shrouded in mystery, spreads virulently through the citizenry. It's accompanied by fits of hysteria, delirium, and deformation. A deer has released insidious and imperceptible corruption from his hellish realm. Rogar energies permeate Mornstead and afflict all. Calm and reason descend into chaos and aggression as Bramus attempts to administer a kingdom that is rapidly consumed by disorder. The hallowed sentinels and their Empyrean judge cleric turn callous, grow nettlesome, violent, and paranoid. In this plague they see the working of a deer and so launch ruthless inquisitions to root out occult heresy. This creates friction between sentinels and Mornstead faithful. Many, including the knight commander Fitzroy, see in judge cleric an imperious tyrant pressing her will upon Bramus. Sentinels must be stopped. We cannot tolerate this any longer. The barbarism they displayed yesterday was only the latest in a long line of offenses. But we all know there will be many more and greater crimes to come. Surely, Mornstead has suffered long enough in their shadow. To deliver them from the Sentinels' wrath, several among Kalrath City's nobility turned to the worship of the forsaken and long forgotten god Adir. Queen Sophia, fearful that royal authority will be stripped by these radiant zealots, finds herself drawn to Adir's cult and drowned in the wave of worship. She, who wishes to preserve for her family a safe future, is distraught by recent events. In dark corners, lit by midnight oil, Queen Sophia professes herself to Adir, ignorant to the depths of his vainglory and spite. For the god sees in Queen Sophia a pawn to being manipulated a means to infiltrate Mornstead's leadership and orchestrate his glorious return. To prove her devotion, a deer commands Sophia to gather artifacts and baubles infused with his energy from millennia past, and as recompense, he teaches her the ways of outlawed Rogar pyromancy. In the charred marketplace of Kalrath City, we see faithful knight Fitzroy procure these Rogar artifacts under utmost secrecy. I know who you are as well, and I know you're a man experienced in acquiring items of an illicit nature, a practice I'm willing to overlook. 
Should you put it to use for me? Tell me, what do you know of Rogar artifacts? Weeks pass into months as Sophisha continues to worship in secret shrines chiseled into mountain rock, her illustrious god. Proof of her faith and his wonderful boon manifests in her increasing skills. All the while, he twists Sophisha's mind, corrupts it to believe in his cause. She blinds herself to his internal machinations as she readies Mornstead for his resurrection. As you can see, I've been honing my skills as you instructed. And you were right. I feel my power growing every day. Soon, I swear, I will be ready. With his return, she might yet save her kingdom from Judge Cleric's terrors. A bargain is struck in the darkness, and as Sophisha pledges undying loyalty, a deer promises to invigorate Mornstead's leadership to defeat Cleric and her sentinels. But deals made with devils are never what they seem. As Mornstead falls victim to Rogar energies unleashed by their perfidious queen, hysteria, paranoia, violence, so too does Adir's influence gain purchase in her loving husband. For Adir possessed an especially keen enmity towards those humans who styled themselves rulers, kings included. King Bramus is plagued by an unknown affliction of the mind. At times, inhuman rage launches him into aggressive rampage. At others, profound melancholy casts him into the depths of despondency. And others yet, senseless ramblings pour from his mouth. Bramus' disease enfeebles the king and incapacitates him from many royal duties. He's saved from despair by a joyful announcement, however. But you'd never abandon your throne or your wife. You're right. Of course, or my child. You're going to be a father. Congratulations to you and Sophesi. His loving queen Sophisha has given birth to a beautiful child named Edivar. The infant prince secures the royal succession and briefly settles a kingdom on the precipice of tumult. More importantly, Edivar's glowing vitality draws Bramus out of the cloistered shell of his own mind, and his old self is restored. I can't help but envy his ability to sleep so soundly. It soothes him having you near, and I know how exhausted you are. This sickness... Can wait. I won't allow my weakness to be the ruination of my kingdom. It's not weakness, Bramus. You know that. My love, please. Not now. Let us just enjoy the moment. The Royal Key item's hidden lore reveals how much Bramus comes to rely on Sophisha and Edivar to bolster him against encroaching madness. Very few of his subjects saw beneath the stern visage and commanding presence of King Bramus XVII, and fewer still would have guessed how much strength the formidable king drew from the love in his queen's smile and the innocence in his infant son's eyes. But Adir's corruption briefly abated exerts itself once more on the royal family. Sophisha refuses to see her god's hand in the shocking decline of her husband's disposition, and Bramus is more frequently consumed by fits of insanity. He perpetrates acts of abhorrent brutality, he refuses to listen to counsel, and he is possessed of a megalomania ill-befitting kingship. Signs that Adir worship has infiltrated the royal seat emerge throughout Bramus castle as effigies of hands are painted in blood or erected on sharpened stakes. Hundreds deemed guilty of crimes that can only be guessed are heartlessly mutilated, their appendages offered as sacrifice to glorious Adir. The remnants of King Bramus' horrible wrath lay in pools of blood covered by flies atop feast tables. And this stigma highlights the depravity that has overcome the king's mind who believes himself the controller of all fate. The fate of Mornstead and every single soul within it is mine to decide. Fate in my hands. You would do well to remember that, Fitzroy. Yes, 
your majesty. Bramus' mental affliction and brutal transformation briefly shock Sophia from her reverie. Is this truly the work of her god, or is the dementia instigated by that vile judge cleric? Is she somehow complicit in her kingdom's turmoil and culpable in cursing her loving husband? Under Shadow's blanket, a letter that drips with guilt and regret is hastily penned and Queen Sophia, with the infant Edivar in her trembling hands, quits their castle leaving King Bramus to his inevitable fate. Fearing her and her child's safety, Sophia is whisked from Bramus Castle by her dutiful knight commander Fitzroy. Let us hurry, your majesty. I can take you beyond the castle walls, but then I'm afraid I must return. Too long and my absence will be noted. You've already done more for Edivar and I than I can ever hope to repay, Fitzroy. Thank you. You and the prince are not away yet, and I could not stand idle like so many others and allow the king to carry out such a heinous act. My husband is not the man he once was, but he will not take my son. Behind them, the crazed king's wails echo throughout the grounds upon discovering their flight. The hateful rage manifesting within him from Rogar corruption is intolerable. With frayed sanity, his beautiful family might become his next victims of slaughter. But Bramus is not the only one whose ire they must avoid. Judge Cleric's sentinels, who have asserted themselves as true authority across Mornstead, have uncovered the depths of perfidy that plagues the kingdom. They discover Queen Sophia's heretical Adir worship and resolve to bring judgment upon her. The royal entourage makes for Calrath City a haven for Adir's disciples among the nobility, and location of a beacon that binds him in prison. With her occult practice exposed, with her husband and her throne upended, with hallowed sentinels' blades drawn, encroaching, Sophia is left little recourse than to turn wholly to her god Adir. Already greatly influenced by his venomous whispers and exposed to corrupting Rogar energies, Sophia's mind is not her own. She performs an act of utmost devotion, hopeful salvation will follow. A rite enacted, an incantation whispered, and in a blast of chaotic magic, the Calrath seal is corrupted, its glittering white beam tinged Rogar red. The release of such energy sends mystical shockwaves throughout the area that in an instant shatter what few of Sophia's faculties remain. As her mind crumbles, Edivar's infant body is suffused with seething chaos, and presently transforms into a grotesque abomination, a demon growing in size with a rapacious hunger for human flesh. So long a compliant adherent of her god, the queen cannot realize her fault, her guilt, and her misplaced faith. For power and security, Sophia has doomed her family and her entire kingdom. This is the reward of loyalty. This is the price paid for a bargain made long ago between Sophia and Adir. For as the lore attached to her ring states, in the end, Queen Sophia knew that if she so chose, she could wash her own dried blood from her hands, but not so the blood of all who had suffered and died in the wake of the fateful bargain she made all those years ago. Corruption eats Bramus and the young prince, and Mornstead falls entirely to Adir's privations as innumerable legions of Rogar are unleashed from his demonic realm. As calamity befalls Calrath, the judge cleric sentinels catch Sophia up, and before them lies a terrible scene. Mornstead's queen, covered in blood with eyes glazed over, is raving mad and speaks nonsense. Edivar, the innocent prince, has undergone transmutation. He's no longer human, but rather a deer's unthinking fiend, and as his immensity continues, he ravages rubble-strewn streets. The sentinels apprehend Sophia, take her in chains to the crypts of Skyrest Bridge, and throw her in a wretched dungeon before unfurling endless torture upon her. She is the enemy within. She is the betrayer. She must repent through confession. But Sophia is beyond reason and sanity. 
no longer the Queen of Mornstead filled with poise and confidence. She is a broken prisoner who is worthy only of wallowing in misery. It's in this weave of the royal family's horrid tapestry that the lamp bearer's thread is inserted as they chance upon the tortured prisoner. Battered and bruised with no recollection of her former self, the tortured prisoner sits as a mystery to be solved. Through retreading her steps, we are enlightened to her identity. The prisoner is freed and at least partially revived upon being presented with the searing accusation that lies close by within Skyrest's crypt. A collection of severed fingers used by Adir's worshippers as a catalyst to channel Rogar's sorcery, and used by Sophisha's tormentors as proof of her crimes. That she needs no key to unbind and liberate herself highlights Sophisha's skill in utilizing inferno magic. The tortured prisoner, thankful for her newfound freedom, stands beside one of Adir's fallen Rogar giants. Its magmatic, gruesome visage recalls within Sophisha's fractured mind images of her own son Edivar's ungodly transformation, and through dialogue, she expresses interest in learning the fate of one similar to the giant before her. When I carry only thunder in my heart, I worry lightning will strike me twice. Will you bring news of this fallen one's kin? Kalrath, a city that before the lamp bearer's arrival is already overrun by unspeakable horrors and subject to Adir's fiery wrath, holds deep within its ruined streets a monster. The spurned progeny, a rogar giant horrid and immense, plays with the corpses of nobles as one would toys when they are happened upon by the deathless one. Because they are, the spurned progeny is peculiar for a rogar demon, lending to many things. One being its infantile engagements, hinted at in the giant eyeball item description, dropped upon its defeat. Although the infant Rogar's physical form had grown to a colossal size over time, his mental capacity didn't enjoy the same growth, his tremendous power belying his childlike mind. The flesh in the remembrance of the spurned progeny is reminiscent of a desiccated umbilical cord, symbolizing both a neonatal connection to some maternal entity and a childlike persona. Can this hulking creature be the young Mornstead prince, separated from Queen Sophisha in Calrath during their flight? Indeed, its name, the spurned progeny, evokes images of a child afflicted, cast aside by its kingdom abandoned by a mother full of abhorrence and remorse. Its rogar corruption takes course and transfigures the babe's innocence into an odious behemoth filled with rage and destruction. Upon defeating this terrible rogar and presenting proof of its death to the tortured prisoner, her sorrow is furthered, thus strengthening the conviction that the spurned progeny is indeed of royal blood, a demon damned to hell by the sins of his mother. Poor thing. Why such sadness in your gaze? Shall I sprout petals of flame? Will that make you smile? Save your tears to water the ashes of your siblings. This reality and her guilt is difficult for Sophisha, already of shattered mind, to accept. She laments her child's death in hysteric despondency. He never knew his own face. No one to tell him how beautiful he was. Only through remembrance of her past life can the tortured prisoner be shaken from her days and the pieces of her sanity gathered. To approach her dressed as a Calrath noble stirs sentiment in vacant memories within the tortured prisoner and restores some semblance of calm. After redressing grievances with her poor child and accepting his terrible fate, but rejoicing that his torment is finally ended, the queen hurries to Calrath's holy beacon, the corruption of which she herself was responsible while under Adir's nefarious influence. This is where deceit culminated, where desecration was enacted and great sin committed. The tortured prisoner stands filled with remorse where she, as Queen Sophia of Mornstead and Pawn of Adir, performed infernal rites to free her god. Hindsight offers clarity, and the prisoner returns either in atonement or in an attempt to reverse her grave mistake. 
Queen Sophia's mental stability settles with each step of her torturous past retraced. The fate of her kingdom and her child are made known to her, but what of her loving king, who haunts the desolate wastes of Bramus Castle, and who hasn't been seen since the Rogar invasion? The man with whom she fell deeply in love. The man that, muddled in thought, endangered Sophia and Edivar. The tortured prisoner tasks the lamp bearer with uncovering truth among the rubble, and hands a vial of perfume, the queen sent, to be delivered to Bramus as token proof that she yet lives. You have a kind face. Here, a sweet scent to brighten your day. Although, beware its sour memories. The item's hidden lore attempts to explain Sophia's irredeemable actions, highlighting how far reality is from intention. Those who turn to worship of a deer typically do so not with the intention of being consumed by his inferno, but comforted by the warmth of his divine embrace. Bramus Castle once stood as an indomitable beacon of Mornstead's royalty, its corridors adorned with portraiture detailing a royal family surrounded with compassion, its libraries filled with histories of noble deeds, its halls resounding with festive cheer. Now, it flows with hellish lava, its parapets studded with Rogar crystals, its walks filled with legions of Adir's faithful. It is a symbol of all Mornstead's decline, and it is manifested in King Bramus XVII. His is the misery of a monarch sundered from within, his mind pried open and irreparably damaged, left vulnerable to threats without. The lamp bearer beholds Bramus' pitiful state as they cross the threshold of the castle's throne room, now transformed into a dear shrine from which the dark god intends his planned emergence. The sundered monarch is found, studded with blades, bound in chains, with face to a statue in the likeness of his missing queen. Despite the corruption that twists body and mind, so great is his affection that a shred of the old Bramus trapped within remembers joyful Sophisha. It's a passion that cannot be destroyed, but one that Adir relishes for the spiteful god found satisfaction in the knowledge that deep inside the monstrous Bramus 17th remained a fragment of his former self, which only exacerbated the king's torment. To Adir, Bramus stands as a pretender king, one unfit for the lordship he believes to be his own divine right. He hurls torture upon torture at the king, but Bramus is a man of dauntless conviction. He continues to fight in every known way, defies as best he can an immortal god. As seen in this stigma, he slaughters a contingent of Adir's faithful as they storm and sack the keep, possibly as a bulwark to prevent access to Adir's effigy that dominates the throne. Bramus knows, however, that he cannot trust himself much longer. The mental affliction oppresses his wits. He binds himself in chains around the queen's statue, symbolic of the love and strength to endure she invests in him, an act that placates his own corrupted and ungodly urges. No salvation can be offered to Bramus. The king is beyond redemption. The deathless one is left no choice but regicide, terminating the king's anguish, thus freeing him from torture. It's notable that during our encounter with him, the elegant perfume offered by Queen Sophia can be utilized to stun Bramus. Scent, a powerful trigger for memory, loosens the fetters in which a deer has the king's mind bound. A brief glimmer of hope that Bramus' soul resides within, but lies just beyond salvation. Sophia's child is vanquished, her husband consigned to oblivion's bliss, but what of her own fate as orchestrator of calamity, ruiner of the royal line? Two possible endings lie before the queen and depend upon the lamp bearer's actions. If presented with accoutrements of her past life, mementos of her dear family, Queen Sophia's identity is once more restored to the tortured prisoner and frees her from the maws of insanity. A charred letter the contents of which profess either profound love or wretched guilt, calms the queen's mind. Words. 
faded and half ruined or freshly wet with ink, they can comfort like an embrace or pierce like blades. Likewise, a baby's cloth taken from the royal bedchamber orients Sophia to her darling child and its fate. Oh, my poor boy. Truths like heated iron searing shut wounds. I am almost. With these in her possession, Mornstead's queen is returned. She bestows one final act of kindness upon Bramus and assists the Deathless One in his defeat. Only now, with her family beyond a deer's reach, with her sins atoned, can Sophia finally rest. She kneels as a penitent before her broken throne and relinquishes light and life. Thank you, friend. As much as it pains me, my past is clear to me once more. Regicide is rarely viewed as a favor, but for both that and your efforts in freeing me from the grip of madness, I, Queen Sophia of Mornstead, would see you rewarded with this token. I have no more rage, no more hatred, and I had my fill of grief and sorrow long, long ago. I cannot undo what I did, but deserved or not, If the tortured prisoner is denied her identity, however, if incoherence and treachery consume her, she stands on the veranda overlooking Mornstead's ruin and attacks the Deathless One in hysteric fits. In this fight, her true power is displayed, the gift of inferno sorcery given to her by her benevolent god. Bereft of nobility, mind shattered by a deer, Sophia's legacy is one of a queen unredeemed whose ignominy grew from perversion and the twisting of an accursed deity. And so it is that Mornstead's monarchy has fallen, the royal lineage of Bramus severed by the flaming blade of Rogar invasion. Theirs is a story of unwavering love and fidelity to one another, of terrible mistakes made and faith misplaced. Bramus and Sophia fought bravely to maintain control of their kingdom, but were slighted by the fickle duplicity of a god and confronted by a holy order afflicted with senseless barbarity. Though their minds were shattered, small fragments of their true selves remained, awoken by the remembrance of the other. As in life, so too are they united in death. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this video on the story of Mornstead's royal family. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on Bramus' madness, Sophia's decisions, as well as your own insights and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. I want to thank my amazing supporters over on Patreon, who make all of this possible, and I couldn't do it without their fantastic support. If you'd like to become a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, head to patreon.com slash thelorebarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.